Well, everybody struggles with motivation at some point. It doesn't even need an external force like a pandemic or some other calamity to zap our motivation. There is plenty of things going on that can do that. And in this video, I go through a bunch of them and make some suggestions for how you can deal with it better. And we're starting right now. Before we go into these little points, just one message is that it is super important that you actually have identified a question or a topic that really, really excites you because that is super important and it will just carry you through a lot. Having said that, here is a bunch of motivation zappers and how you can deal with it. Starting with the boredom of lab work. Well, I don't know about you, but you know, a lot of the lab work that is done, is it like weighing roots or washing roots or filling things into cups or pipetting things into 100 test tubes or a thousand experimental units that need to be harvested there is always something extremely impetitive and therefore inherently boring in a lot of the lab work that we do. And so how do you cope with that as a motivation zapper? Well, I think it's important to always remember the exciting question that propelled you to do this experiment in the first place, right? Your experiment that you did is going to be by itself, of course, tremendously less exciting than the big question that propels you into science in the first place. But it's important to always remember <laughs> that connection to the big question of your particular experiment and then to basically put the effort that you had to put that you had to put in in, in this experiment in relation to the to this nicer big question that you're actually addressing. This is ab absolutely essential, I think, in order to stay motivated through the more repetitive and boring bits of lab work. Or if it's not lab work, maybe it's working on a data sheet or whatever, there's always gonna be something like this in whatever we do. Well, also, while you are in a maybe phase that is gonna be bogging you down with repetitive and relatively inherently boring bits of work to do, stay curious. I mean, do break it up with other activities that you know expose you to new ideas and read some papers just for fun or just chat with colleagues and whatever. So it's not just every day, you know, dealing with 10,000 experimental units, but rather it's sort of more broken up with some other activities that you inherently find more enjoyable. I think that's completely necessary and a good thing to do. The next motivation zapper is rejection. <laughs> rejection is ever present in academic life. You all know it. Um, if you have submitted a paper or a grant proposal or whatever have you, a scholarship application, there is always rejection is the rule. Everybody gets rejected. You just don't hear about it, right? Because people don't advertise all their rejections. They only advertise their success stories like on Twitter or something like this. But it's be assured that everybody gets rejected. So how do you deal with that? And clearly this can dampen your motivation enormously. There is no uh, talking around that, but how do you productively deal with this situation? Well, as frustrating as rejections are, usually you get some reviewer comments back, let's say. And while at first maybe you may be angry <laughs> at the reviewer comments and you wanna, you know, basically burn them or <laughs> whatever, it's like, you know, sleep on it and then get back to these reviewer comments in a, another day or two. And usually there is almost always there is something in there that is a, a message for you to improve. You know, this is a, going back to this to the growth mindset, like um, you try to be better, you practice to become more proficient at what you're doing and you also learn from your setbacks and your failures in a productive way and you don't accept things just the way they are. And so maybe it was, even though it hurts, <laughs> that you didn't quite explain things as well as you thought you did in your grant proposal or in your paper because maybe some people simply did not get it. Well, then what you learn from it is maybe you need to rethink how you can better explain it so more people can actually follow your thoughts. Whatever is it, whatever the feedback is, as long as the feedback was constructive, you can usually get something out of it and thereby regain your motivation afterwards. Also, if you don't believe me that other people get rejected, just talk to your more experienced colleagues, your PIs or whatever, and they, they will tell you. 
Well, they can also be challenging external situations such as a war breaking out or a pandemic or some natural catastrophe or a fire or whatever calamity. And, you know, during the lifetime of a lab, which may be about 30 years, like a PI-led lab, I mean, there is a pretty high possibility that at some point something is going to hit. So how do you deal with that? Because clearly that can be a motivation zapper of you know, gigantic proportions if all of a sudden you need to worry about other things. Well, I think one thing that you can do here is um, you can invest in building community in the lab, maybe more than you already have. And this means the PI, but it also means everybody in the lab. This is a, a community effort. So it's not enough if the PI does it. Of course, it's bad if the PI doesn't invest, but <laughs> even if the PI does invest, it, it takes everybody's contribution to build a better community in the lab. And if you have a better community in the lab, then you can also deal with many insults that that lab might receive better. Uh, we've actually written a paper about that um, and this was also one of the cathartic ways of how we dealt with, dealt with for example, the, uh, the pandemic in 2020 when the lab was shut down as we got together and basically worked on a paper how we think we could deal better with the situation and this in a way has helped us because we connected to the situation through our work or our thinking and this may not always apply admittedly but maybe it applies more often than you think it does so somehow connect your lab's work or outlook or at least some tools that you use in the lab to the situation and it also makes you feel more useful because one of the effects usually is is like Oh, now this happened, but you know we don't work on viruses or we don't work on um, supply chains for agriculture or whatever. But you know, if you think a little bit further, then maybe you do make this connection to your work and in some way, and then it also makes you feel more useful in a situation like this. Well, the next one is frustration when you don't reach your goals or something that you thought you should have by now, or when you're feeling that you're you're sort of falling behind on things. Well, the first thing you need to do then is assess, and also with the help of others like your mentor or a PI or colleagues, am I actually having realistic goals? Because some people do not have realistic goals. For example, when they start a PhD or whatever, they have this, um, myself included, they have this um, sense that they need to do something earth shattering and totally revolutionize their branch of science entirely, right? And so this is very, very unlikely to happen for this. You have another 20, 30 years of career afterwards after you get your PhD but it's very unlikely to happen during a PhD. I mean, it can happen and it's wonderful, but you know, you shouldn't be expecting it. And so like one thing is to always assess, do I have realistic goals? And part of that is also, am I expecting things too soon? This can also mean like applying for certain grant opportunities like an ESC grant or whatever prestigious kind of grants there are. Am I expecting this too soon? You know, is a critical self-assessment in order? Should I maybe wait until I have more experience or yeah, am I just wanting things too soon could be one of the reasons for the frustration and therefore be a motivation zapper. But in the, in the, in the end, it was not warranted uh, because uh, you were just asking for too many things too soon. And also, are these your goals or do you let others set your goals for you? I mean, to some extent, maybe they can be a, not be avoided in a certain administrative context at a university. But for the most part, we, I think, as scientists make our own pressures rather than <laughs> having that pressure from somebody else from the outside. And I think that is very important to critically self-assess is this really what I want or is that something that I just think I should be wanting or achieving because I think other people expect it of me. Well, and I think the last uh, motivation zapper I want to discuss here is like science is a lonely endeavor. This is sometimes being depicted as the person that sits at their desk and like has a great idea and figures things out and basically in the end produces this final result. And this is, you know, very much not how this typically works and shouldn't work because it is, um, this is why we're organized in labs. I mean, we, we don't do things on our own. We profit from each other. We help each other out and we learn and exchange and progress faster when we interact with other people. So, you know, you need to break through that um, con concept of you are needing to figure things out by yourself all the time and um, just working on by yourself. This is not the way to do it. But what can you do? I mean, you can do a number of things. You can, you know, start maybe co-learning groups in your lab or you can give talks. And most labs I know have trouble filling their time slots. And so usually people are more than happy to have you give a talk in lab meeting. This is not typically a limited resource. So you just um, 
give yourself that push and present in lab meeting and then sometimes you might, might be surprised by the connections that you make by even making this presentation in a lab meeting. And of course also network. I don't mean networking you know in this business sense of getting ahead kind of thing that seems like cold and calculated. I mean networking in the sense of you know building a community of people that you like to interact with. Uh, sort of like your scientific friends, your buddies that you collaborate with or that you ask questions and you know you, there's a variety of ways you can make these connections. The most low threshold is on social media for example like on Twitter but of course you can also send a targeted email to somebody I found your paper really interesting on this and that maybe we can exchange on that and that. So I mean this is um, now possible. You can start in your lab of course uh, making these connections but this also includes going outside the lab and making connections as they fit. And of course this means collaborate whenever possible. Don't do things always on your own. You know help others with their project. Others will then help you with your project and it, um, everybody benefits because it makes it more of a communal effort and it's more productive and better that way. Finally don't forget about your work-life balance. I mean um, also meeting people outside of work like in sports or chess or whatever you like to do or um, maybe not read books even though you could read books with others as well I suppose but you know find something that um, outside of work that will also connect you with other people and I think um, then you can overcome this sort of a lone wolf uh, syndrome that sometimes is associated with science incorrectly and uh, yeah with that I hope <laughs> that I went through some of the main um, motivation zappers the ones that I could think of anyway uh, if you have others please let me know in the comments but I hope that the remedies I presented here will help you overcome them and be productive and happy and have joy in your work because that is super important and with that thanks for watching see you in the next video bye